And this is Catherine Labracht. I do the programs for Illinois Mycological Association. Our speaker tonight is, um, is Stephen, Ru Steve, it's Stephen Russell. For some reason, I keep putting you down as Stephen Douglas, but I have reformed myself, but apparently uh, I made that mistake again somewhere else. Uh, Stephen Russell, uh, we've been working with him with the microflora project, um, which I hope he'll talk about. And you know what? I'll let him take over and tell him about himself because I didn't take my notes on that. So there you go. So rather than embarrass myself and say something wrong, I'll let him take over. So yeah, I am. Uh, my name is Steve Russell. I'm the president of the Hoosier Mushroom Society, and we've been doing uh, having that organization for about 10 years now. So we started that in 2009. So it's uh, this last year, I guess, was technically our uh, anniversary. Uh, but uh, I've been the president of it that whole time. And that's right around the time I really started getting into uh, identifying wild mushrooms. And so what, what, I'll talk more about myself in a, in a little bit. But what we're going to be talking about is that today is a path to knowing all the mushrooms of Illinois. And that's a pretty ambitious title and a pretty ambitious concept and project. Uh, but that's really what we're working towards in Indiana is trying to, you know, get a get a baseline level of understanding and knowledge of all of the mushrooms, all of the macro fungi uh, that exist within our state. And so a lot of what we do over in Indiana is going to be directly applicable uh, to most of the biodiversity that occurs in Illinois as well. And so um, that's one of the reasons why I'm kind of excited to talk to you guys tonight uh, to see uh, how, how we may be able to work together to fulfill some of our mutual goals and really understand the bi biodiversity for the region. Kind of understanding what occurs, where it occurs, and when it occurs is really my primary interest within mycology at this point, and it's really foundational knowledge for many other aspects of mycology. So whether you're talking about fungal ecology, climate change, uh, many of the applied mycology topics or plant pathogens, uh, getting, getting that baseline understanding of what occurs, where it occurs, and when it occurs uh, can really help advance all of these various fields within the, within the field of mycology. Well, when, when you start to think about under, getting this understanding, um, actually surveying the biodiversity that exists out in nature, if you look in the scientific literature, if you're into fungal ecology, there's really several different levels of diversity that people uh, ultimately discuss um, when you're looking to do these types of biodiversity surveys. And so the, the first one is alpha diversity. And that can generally be thought of as the diversity of a single site. If you look on the right hand side, uh, uh, the image on the screen, uh, this is one of my research plots down in Southern Indiana. And this covers about, this image is probably about a 15 to 20 mile um, you know, di diameter region. And there are nine separate research areas. It's something called the Hardwood Ecosystem Experiment. It's a hundred year project uh, within Indiana to really try to understand the ecology of our hardwood forests. And a part of hardwood forest ecology is the study of fungi. And so I was really happy to be involved in this project. But when you're getting back to the levels of biodiversity, when you think about alpha diversity, it can be thought of as the diversity on one of these plots. Uh, another level is beta diversity. And so if you're looking at the difference in biodiversity between two of these plots, uh, that's generally how beta diversity could be thought of. Gamma diversity is a level above that to where you can think of it as regional diversity. So what is the biodiversity of all of the, these different plots across this regional gradient? But ultimately what I'm interested in is something called epsilon diversity, which is even a higher level of diversity uh, <clears throat> that's often not even taught within this concept, but it's really something on the order of like a million hectares or you know up to 100 million hectares or something to that effect and so in the state of indiana is roughly about 10 million hectares so it falls right within line of that level of biodiversity and so that's really what i'm interested in, in understanding is the epsilon diversity of macro fungi for the state of indiana and so one of the fundamental questions you know with a project and a, and a thought process this large is really what when I started off this project, uh, it, was, it was kind of intended to be a 10 year time frame. So that was the goal. You know, um, how can we document the most biodiversity in the shortest time frame at the lowest cost with the highest accuracy? And so a lot of these goals often conflict with each other. Um, but really the, the conclusion that I came to, it's a job that's far beyond any individual or even group of people working. And so you really have to have these large collaborations with citizen scientists 
and then also do DNA barcoding of the ITS region um, for fungi. That's uh, the, the barcode region for fungi if you're into DNA. And so th this combination of things, so citizen science collaboration, working with as many people as possible all across the state on a regular basis, as well as doing the DNA barcoding, um, was kind of the path that I um, started down to, you know, to, to really understand the total biodiversity at the lowest cost with the highest accuracy. And so understanding what occurs, where it occurs, and when it occurs um, is really important across many of these uh, various uh, aspects of mycology. So let me, let me give you a few examples of how this type of knowledge might actually um, help to understand uh, some of these different fields of mycology better. So if you're into mushroom cultivation, which I would say I, I'm, I used to be into mushroom cultivation. I'm not that much of a mushroom cultivator anymore, uh, but that's actually what got me started. Uh, there's a book I wrote back in, I think it was published in 2014 now, uh, the Essential Guide to Cultivating Mushrooms. I'm not much of a cult mushroom cultivator anymore. I just don't have the time. But it's, it's definitely a topic I'm interested in and passionate about. But if you're looking at mushroom cultivation as an example, as one of the first examples uh, of how understanding of biodiversity can be helpful, um, there's uh, the, the mushroom in the background. It's, um, it's a Ganoderma, one of the lacate Ganoderma species. And there was a study that was published recently uh, within the last few years uh, where they looked at 17 mushroom cultivation kits uh, that were being sold as Ganoderma lucidum uh, across the United States. And so out of those 17 kits, half of those, uh, half of those kits did not actually contain the species Ganoderma lucidum. And 17, uh, or sorry, 11 of the 17 kits uh, contain non-native species to, to the United States kind of along a similar uh, train of thought, uh, there's a lot of uh, mushroom products that are often sold as Ganoderma lucidum. You know, they can be pills, they can be tablets, they can be teas. And there was a separate study that looked at 37 of these products uh, being sold as Ganoderma lucidum, and 93% of them did not contain that actual species. And so other species that were contained that we might have um, here locally, uh, Ganoderma aplanatum and Cecil, um, we would have both of those locally, but the majority of these products that are being sold as, you know, being billed as one uh, specific species are not actually containing this, the species. And so when you start to think about, you know, what's the bioactivity of these different species, what, what are the chemical constituents that are most commonly found in all these species, it's really going to vary uh, between species. And so if you're buying something, you know, if you're buying something based on medical research um, that was, uh, conducted on an individual species. If you're actually gaining, uh, when, when you buy a product, if you're not actually buying the species you're intended for, uh, the, the ultimate consequences and the, the ultimate uh, bioactivity or you know, what, whatever the purpose is you're buying it for uh, might not be fulfilled if you aren't actually getting the species that you were, that it was being billed at. And you hear about this kind of thing in, in many different industries. You know, one in three fish sold at restaurants is mislabeled. Um, fish build isn't always local, so you might, uh, you know, get fish from a, across the ocean, you know, from overseas or something like that. Uh, there's a funny one at the bottom. Study finds DNA in 10% um, horse DNA in 10% of meat dishes in Mexico. And so <laughs> these are just a few uh, additional examples of how, you know, DNA research is really uh, starting to impact uh, the supply chain and the food supply and our understanding of what it is we're actually putting into our bodies. And th this has actually been um, uh, an issue that's been uh, specifically noted for the International Journal of Medicinal Mushrooms. Um, what they said recently was divergent nomenclatures has caused major difficulties in the evaluation of pharma pharmacological studies of these lacate Ganoderma species. And so what that essentially is saying is if you don't know what it is, um, the ultimate results of the study are going to be in question um, because they might have been using multiple species in a study or they might be using a different species in the study. And if there's not actually verification uh, of the, the individual species, um, the, the entire line of research uh, can and should be called into question. And that's been a pretty significant problem, I would say, with a lot of past medicinal mushroom research um, within medicine as well, even within cultivation. There's a lot of mushroom cultivation research that's ongoing. And if they aren't actually uh, utilizing the species that they intended to um, within the context of their study, that really does call uh, the entire study into question. And so these, that was uh, 
one example within the you know the the medicinal mushroom line. Let me give a let me give you a couple more examples of how understanding what occurs, where it occurs, and when it occurs can be really important. Um, so a number of years ago now, um, maybe five or six, I want to say there was a study done in uh, England in in London. Uh, a researcher went to a market in London and picked up several packets of Boletus edulis, uh, porcini mushrooms, wild harvested porcini mushrooms in London. Uh, the packages contained 15 individual species and, uh, sorry, 15 individual pieces of uh, porcini mushrooms. And out of those 15 pieces, they found three unnamed species, uh, three species that were new to science within those 15 pieces in a market in London. Uh, they ultimately had come from China, um, where there's still a whole lot of uh, research left to be done on mushrooms uh, and, and their local biodiversity. But that just shows even within your hometown, it's possible to even go to a store uh, and find new species of mushrooms that are uh, contained within, your, within the grocery. Climate change is another area where uh, understanding what occurs, where it occurs, and when it occurs can be really important. And this was a study that came from uh, a research at Purdue University, uh, where I've uh, been the last few years working towards a PhD. And what this, uh, what this chart's essentially showing is the, the central point of the range of tree species, of 85, uh, 86 different species of trees, I believe, um, how it shifted from 1980 to 1915. And so you can see a lot of the, a lot of the, end of the, the centroid, the central um, point uh, of the range of an individual tree species is sh often shifted uh, to the west and to the north a bit over the course of that time. The researchers found about 20% of the movement of these of the range of trees uh, could could have been um, as a result of climate change. But once you start getting uh, ecological knowledge of mushrooms and, and their uh, range and habitats, and when they fruit, you can start doing a similar thing for mushrooms. Uh, and so an interesting case study in this might be Ammonita thirstii. Uh, and you guys would probably have it in Chicago. We start finding it in Indiana quite regularly now. Um, but back in the 19... Give me one second. Um, just a little more background uh, about that mushroom, I guess. Uh, it's, a, it's a member of Ammonita section Lepidella, um, or in the genus Sapro Ammonita, uh, if you guys believe in that genus. And there's some dispute on whether or not that's a valid genus currently. I tend to lean against it, but uh, it's, definitely, it's definitely valid. Um, and one, one of the things that makes Thirsii interesting, it's one of several species of Ammonita that are not mycorrhizal. So they most commonly occur within lawns, you know, not associated with trees. They often grow in fairy rings. But if you start looking uh, where it was first documented, uh, it goes back in the 1950s, 1960s, uh, down into Texas. And so that's where they really uh, started to first see it within the United States. And if you start charting the course over the course of time, in the 1970s, they started finding it in Arkansas, in the 1980s, uh, through Missouri, Southern Illinois, up into Indiana in the 1990s. And more recently, you know, if you, and this is one of the benefits of uh, a site like iNaturalist or a mushroom observer. Um, Patrick will be talking about iNaturalist here shortly. But once you start getting this uh, ecological data, once there's lots of people starting to post observations, really all you need is observational data to really start charting the course of this species over time and understanding its broader range and distribution. And so it, you can, uh, the, the black line in the center is essentially what uh, that last study did. It was just kind of charting the course of uh, the central point of the range over the course of time for this species. And you can see it's kind of been in, invading uh, most of the Midwest uh, throughout that period of time. And just simple observational data, especially for something uh, like Amanita thirsii, it is um, <clears throat> very, very easy to identify mushroom. There's not much else that looks very similar to it. And so really, you know, you don't need a lot of DNA research to be able to do a study like this. Um, oftentimes pictures are easily enough to be able to get a, an accurate identification of the species. But once you start understanding what occurs and where it occurs and when it occurs, um, there's, there's a lot of new lines of uh, research that can be opened up, uh, especially for fungal ecology. Fungal conservation is another important uh, topic that's been gaining more momentum in recent years. Um, this is a pretty uncommon species, I would say. I'm pretty, personally, I'm pretty interested in white spored free gild agarics. So things like Amanita, Lepiota, uh, the Lepi, you know, Lepiotoids broadly. But yeah, the, the white spored free gild agarics. And this one's a little interesting because it's a Lepiota with yellow gills. And so the, the species is actually known as Lepiota luteophila. 
and it was recently placed on the, the global red list for fungi. And so in the Midwest, we're still not certain whether this is going to be determined to be the same species as in the West. Um, but there's only been a couple places it's been documented. I believe it's only known from Michigan, uh, where there's a couple collections, as well as from Indiana. Um, there's a spot I go to. I can find it almost every year, uh, now that I know where the patch is. Um, but it's a pretty in interesting small white sport uh, free gilded garrick. But fungal conservation is really dependent upon <clears throat> understanding uh, where these things occur and um, you know what, and, and where they occur. So that way we know the range and, and how rare they might be. Without that kind of information on many different species, we, we aren't able to accurately make assessments. Uh, are these things endangered? Uh, you know, should they be red listed? Ultimately, which will provide extra protection uh, for the species. Uh, kind of the fungal, uh, <laughs> kind of the final uh, point I'll make along these lines is, is dealing more with fungal ecology. And for fungal ecology, if you've been following uh, the field lately, uh, a lot of what has been uh, occurring is known as environmental sequencing or eDNA, uh, environmental DNA. So really going out into the environment and you know whether it's water or whether it's soil. Um, but what you can do is look at all the DNA of the mushrooms that occur within the soil, you really only need a small amount of soil and you can get hundreds or even thousands of different species of fungi just based on the DNA uh, that occurs there. So you might not even have to have an actual <clears throat> physical specimen of the mushroom to be able to start charting uh, it, its ultimate range and where it might exist and where it might ultimately fruit. And so with, with um, eDNA, you really kind of start off with just a whole bunch of A's, G's, C's, and T's. It's really difficult to tell what species this is by looking at that string of letters. And so even the best uh, fungal DNA studies uh, that deal with environmental sequencing, they're, they're ultimately gonna need to have faces, what I, what I refer to as faces, or local vouchered specimens, uh, that you're able to match up the DNA sequences from this known species to this jumbled mass of letters uh, that this is the output of what you might see from an environmental DNA study. So even if the field moves, you know, even further along than it already has in terms of environmental DNA, it's still, there's still always gonna be a fundamental place for having these, uh, these vouchered collections, for going out into the woods, for collecting the mushrooms that are out there and doc, you know, documenting them uh, locally. That, that's something that's only be gonna, gonna become uh, more important as more researchers uh, continue to use environmental sequencing as their uh, modality for research. And so ultimately, <clears throat> my philosophy on what I'm attempting to do in Indiana is to do the most extensive field collecting of macro fungi as possible, combine that with as much environmental uh, sampling as possible. And what that should ultimately come up with is a reasonably comprehensive accounting of the macro fungi that occur in Indiana. I say reasonably comprehensive that uh, if you deal with mushrooms, you know there's a, a lot of species that are very common and then there's even more species uh, that are less common. So we often say there's a long tail of species uh, of these very uncommon species that just aren't encountered very often. Um, but what I, what I often refer to is I'm trying to gain a reasonably comprehensive, not, not a complete, but reasonably comprehensive understanding of the mushrooms that exist. And so you, most of you have probably heard the term mycoflora by this point. And what, what that is, is essentially a list of species that occur across a defined geographic area. So for Indiana, when I think about micro, mycoflora, I think of, you know, individual collections of mushrooms. I, you know, I don't, I never add anything to my list of species that occur in Indiana. Um, unless I have a physical vouchered specimen of it that also has a DNA sequence associated with it. But the, 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 the vouchered specimen is going to need things like the collection date, the collection location, um, the physical specimen. Color photographs are vitally important to me, uh, as well as uh, the DNA sequence for uh, the individual species of mushroom. And so when you combine these different aspects together and, and you look at it across um, most different groups of macro fungi, uh, kind of the end resulting list uh, that, you, that you might generate from this kind of research 
is what is typically known as a mycophora. So it's a, a list of all the species that occur. And so as I mentioned, my current interests are uh, primarily documenting all of the macrofungi, all of the mushrooms that exist within Indiana and finding that answer by engaging citizen scientists as much as, as is possible. Uh, iNaturalist has been one of the best tools for that. Uh, Facebook has been a really incredible tool for that. I don't utilize Facebook uh, too much for too many things, but I can tell you, even if you, what I often tell people locally is even if you don't uh, like Facebook or like getting on it, the, the mushroom community on there is quite stellar. Uh, and it's definitely one of the best uh, sources for mushroom information to be able to track what species are fruiting where. Um, you know, joining, there, there's mushroom groups on basically any topic that you can imagine. And so I often encourage people uh, at our forays locally, even if they don't get on Facebook, to consider it just for mushrooms um, because it's uh, really been a valuable asset to me. And, and um, I definitely utilize it extensively for that purpose. Now, the final thing they're producing technical technological solutions that lower the barriers of entry. I'm not gonna get into that uh, really at all today. Uh, that's something, uh, I'm really into technology. So if um, anyone would like to talk to me about that later, uh, we can definitely do that. And so one of the limiting factors to these goals that I've found is the number of modern collections that are available. And so that just simply means the number of recent uh, specimens of mushrooms uh, that are accessible to me. Uh, so what one of the <coughs> main reasons for that is if you, if you look at where these stars are, these are some of the major university towns within Indiana, and each of these stars represents a mycologist that uh, currently works within the state. And so you can see it's a pretty large land area for not very many mycologists. And so that's one of the fundamental reasons why engaging citizen scientists all across the state is really important because if we really just count on professional mycologists to make any kind of substantive impact towards understanding biodiversity on these scales, it's not gonna happen within the lifetimes of any of us. So it's really gonna be incumbent upon uh, individuals and clubs to really start taking some of these next steps if we're going to make a significant understanding of, uh, work, working towards a significant understanding of the mushrooms that exist. Um, for Indiana, as an example, there are still, to this day, no field guides that exist for Indiana. Not even, I don't even believe there's an edible mushrooms of Indiana book. Um, and so what I often refer people to within our state is mushrooms of the Midwest, um, <coughs> excuse me, mushrooms of West Virginia and Central Appalachians, uh, the great book from Illinois uh, for wild edible mushrooms, um, as well as there's a newer one from uh, Timberoni out east. It's, it's pretty good. Has, the reason why I suggest that now is it has a number of species that aren't commonly included in other field guides. Um, but even just this baseline knowledge of information for most people, uh, you know, usually when people are wanting to get into a subject and they start to think about, um, you know, starting to learn what the mushrooms are, their first thought is to go buy a book. And well, for Indiana at least, and I would say probably for Illinois as well, uh, just the amount of information that's available in the published literature is somewhat limited. Um, and most of you probably have an appreciation for this. Why are mushrooms so difficult to study? Some of the things I've been talking about already, but the fundamental fact is that they're microscopic organisms. Uh, you know, the hyphae uh, of a mushroom is microscopic and the, the mushrooms themselves are ephemeral. They're only short lived. Um, and there's significant morphological variation within uh, an individual species or a species complex. Uh, just a little more about my personal background. Well, what, one of the things I guess here that, that makes me somewhat unique um, within the mushroom world and people that are actually pursuing, uh, you know, a PhD in mushrooms, I actually pursue this as a hobby. So I've never actually met anybody else uh, that, you know, went back to school to study PhD for their hobby. Uh, but that's essentially what I did. Um, so I, I, most of my uh, background is, you know, I used to work in politics uh, and I uh, used to work in supply chain logistics as well, which actually uh, is a big part of what I do currently as well. But <clears throat> even, even if, uh, you, you know, you're in one of these various fields, and I, I would say, especially within mycology, there's a very long history. Uh, within a, a lot of the best mycologists throughout history, they weren't professional mycologists. It's, it's one of the areas of scientific research 
where uh, amateurs or citizen scientists or people that just don't do it professionally can make a very, very substantive impact. And so one of the ways I would say that any individual uh, that's watching this today can make a substantive impact within mycology is simply the process of documenting the mushrooms that you encounter and saving the specimens. Uh, so there's a lot of people that go out and take pictures of mushrooms, um, but the, the images in most cases are going to be, ha have limited, limited efficacy um, relative to if a specimen was saved as well. And so that's one of the things I guess I would encourage everybody who's watching today to really start making a, a part of what you do is to start saving uh, some of the, the less common and more important species. You don't need to go out and save every black staining polypore you encounter. Uh, you know, that's not really the point. But, uh, you know, if you start making, you know, starting yourself off with a dozen or two dozen collections over the course of a given year, um, you can really start to, you know, over the course of time, really start to uh, make an impact in terms of knowledge on your local biodiversity. Uh, as Patrick talked about, uh, I, I believe one of your next presentations this next week is going to be about iNaturalist, and that's something I wanted to talk to you briefly about today. I'm not going to go too into detail, uh, into too many details about the, the, the actual function of it. But something we started doing in Indiana back in 2017 now, so this will be our, I believe our fourth year for it, uh, is what, what we refer to as online forays. And so back in 2017, this was the results of our first online foray. It was done in the fall of 2017. And over the course of a week, we had 1,300 observations of 282 species. But most importantly for this specific event is we really encouraged the collection of mushrooms. So uh, I believe uh, as a result of this, we had uh, roughly, I wanna say eight to 900 collections out of those 1300 observations sent to me as a part of this event. Uh, and then from there, you know, I, we, we don't save every single specimen. Uh, you know, we're gonna get, if you look on the screen, there's 20 observations of turkey tail. We don't need 20 collections uh, of really most species of Tremedes at this point. And so, you know, there is a filtering process. We, we ultimately, you know, whittled that number down. But the end result of this is we DNA sequenced about 500 species, uh, 500 collections uh, from this week long event. And, and the knowledge that we gain uh, from this type of broad based, uh, these surveys, these mass collections, uh, I kind of refer to it sometimes as vacuuming up all the mushrooms that uh, are currently fruiting across the state at any one time. Um, the, the amount of knowledge that we gain in the number of collections can be quite substantial. And so, Briefly about how it works is we have an iNaturalist project that you're looking at here. Anybody across the state can participate. One of the advantages that we have in Indiana relative to you guys in Chicago is that we're, we're allowed to go and forage mushrooms on public land without uh, the need for permits. And so that's definitely a big advantage for us in terms of just being able to go out whenever we want, wherever we want, really anywhere across the state and, and collect mushrooms. And so there, there are a few more you know, hurdles you might have to jump through, especially in certain parts of Illinois. But, uh, you know, with a little bit of planning, uh, this, this type of uh, event could definitely be possible uh, throughout many areas uh, of your state as well. We have a, online currently to where people can download their own field data slips and each, each field data slip is individually numbered um, at the bottom, uh, starting with one and going up from there. Uh, but e each field slip will have a unique barcode associated with it. Uh, and th this serves several purposes. W one of the key ones is for organization. So un until you've brought home a hundred different collections of mushrooms in a single day and then tried to organize them from there with all of the photos uh, and everything that goes along with it, uh, you probably wouldn't be able to appreciate how um, advantageous a numbering system is. Most mycologists have their own numbering system, you know, something with their initials and, you know, kind of going up from there. So like SDR001 and up. Uh, but you don't, you don't have to use this kind of personal collection number system. It's, all, it's possible to <clears throat> ultimately what I use anymore for my collection numbers are the iNaturalist numbers. So. Uh, ultimately, that's, uh, that's been a very useful collection number method for me. Uh, but once you bring these things home, 
these numbers really help to organize all of your collections and to, and to keep them all separate and to keep all of the images associated with everything properly. The iNaturalist has a mobile application that I use quite regularly uh, that's been very beneficial. Um, one of the aspects of this I would mention is you don't have to actually utilize the, um, you don't have to utilize the, the mobile application in the field. So often what I'll do, typically always what I do, is I'll take pictures on my cell phone out in, out in the field, you know, out, out in the woods while I'm there. And then I upload all of them utilizing the iNaturalist app once I arrive back home. And so when you're out in the woods, you really don't want to be screwing around with technology and fussing around with internet connections. And so just it's totally possible not to do it. Uh, you can bring, uh, just take your pictures uh, out in the field and then utilize the mobile application once you get home. Uh, but this is an example of how even in the field, uh, these numbers can really help to organize your collections. If you're collecting 10 different types, uh, species of Amanitas in a given day, and if some of them look the same, it's really helpful to have an image with a number uh, to go along with the specimens that you collect. Ultimately, when I get back home, organizing them and drying them. And this is where the numbers that are in triplicate on these uh, collection slips come in handy. For me personally, I take uh, tissue samples of each mushroom I collect. So for each of those specimens, you can see um, the, the dry, collection number for drying below the, the, the specimen, as well as a, a tube that's labeled with the um, collection number as well. And so uh, that's often been uh, very beneficial for me just in terms of organization. And ultimately, uh, the result of one of these online forays is th this is the, the boxes that were sent by the person who collected the most on our first foray. I think she had 100, I want to say 170, 180 uh, collections over the course of that week that she made. And it was just a phenomenal amount of uh, data and interesting things that she found uh, coming in. Um, I think she collected maybe three or four days during that week to come up with that number of specimens. And believe it or not, most of them were not duplicates. Uh, most of them were not just common species. I think you know a, a significant portion of those were actually retained um, within the herbarium. And so, one of the the, the main reasons uh, that I mentioned this in particular is we're going to be doing this event um, here in two weeks. It's going to be our, we, we do these online forays twice a year now. We do one in the summer and one in the fall for Indiana. And um, I think I'll, I'll wait until the end to um, speak a bit more about that. But so if you think back to the beginning of the talk, one of the questions I posed is how can we document the most biodiversity in the shortest amount of time at the lowest cost with the highest accuracy? And I would say the citizen science model, uh, particularly these online forays, uh, combined with DNA barcoding um, ha have really been one of the most advantageous things for us to be able to document the maximum amount of biodiversity uh, in the shortest time frames possible. So it's just a few ad advantages of this online foray model. <clears throat> it, it really brings in many more people than a traditional foray would, at least for us. So I know you guys might get, uh, you know, a uh, hundred people coming to a foray and that typically doesn't happen uh, within Indiana as much. Uh, I was talking to some of your organizers and it probably would happen if we held more events in Indianapolis, but most of our events are held at various uh, smaller state parks, really all around the state as a part of what we do. Um, we really organize our forays going from the top of the state, um, you know, in, in the dunes or over in Pokagon in the Northeast, all the way down to uh, the, the Ohio River. And so we really broadly uh, I do a lot of the driving uh, throughout the year within Indiana um, because we really are trying to document uh, mushrooms from as many places as possible across the state. But these online forays, if you think about <clears throat> how, uh, how they actually work, you know, it's for an individual. If, if we're doing these mu uh, mushroom forays all across the state and, you know, it takes four hours to drive from northern Indiana to southern Indiana or more, it, you know, it can be quite costly, both in terms of time uh, as well as money uh, for people to come and participate at a large portion of our forays. And so what these online events really allow us to do is to, you know, give people the opportunity to make a substantive scientific contribution or just, you know, really a fun contribution 
uh, wherever they are. You know, people can go out into their lawns and have the possibility of finding a first record for Indiana, and that happens quite regularly. I don't know if uh, any of you follow our Facebook group, Indiana Mushrooms. Uh, we, we often uh, interact there a lot and post a lot there, and I'm often requesting specimens from people that post there uh, all the time. Uh, but just the ability of people to go out and then have, a, have an avenue, an outlet, to where they can uh, post their photos, they can request additional information, and ultimately make a, v a valuable scientific contribution is something that a lot of people really enjoy. Um, you know, that everybody likes to find something new and find something interesting and find something in their neighborhood that other people have an interest in. Uh, another big advantage of these online foray models is if you think about just the location of an individual foray, when you're scheduling it, it might be really dry, uh, you know, at the foray site uh, for, for the dates that you intended to uh, collect there. But when you uh, organize an online foray, and we do these over the course of a week long event, uh, but you're guaranteed to have some prime areas somewhere within um, the state to where you're going to be able to find lots of interesting things, you know, wherever things happen to be fruiting uh, at any given time. And ultimately, just it's a, it's a learning process for a lot of people. Uh, making collections and drying them out isn't the easiest thing for a lot of people. You know, you have, it costs some money. You have to have a dehydrator or, you know, some type of a fan or drying apparatus um, in order to do it. But it really starts people down the path of starting to make collections. And so I would say most of the people that participated in that first online foray in 2017, uh, you know, for some of them, it's really kicked off the fire for mycology. You know, it's, it's especially from my end, if I can get back to them with the information of their collections about what was found, why it's interesting, you know, what are the DNA results. Um, when people know that they can uh, you know, submit specimens and, and ultimately get back DNA sequences from their local collections uh, that they find uh, within their region. That's something that's really kicked off the fire in a number of people. And, you know, I have a number of people now that send me hundreds of collections every year. Uh, and that's something that's been, been really valuable uh, for our club and for our efforts in, in terms of uh, really trying to understand our, our broad-based biodiversity. So those are just a couple of advantages uh, that we found from this online foray model uh, that, that have been really beneficial for our club. Um, but I think uh, ma many aspects would work really well uh, in, in at least certain parts of Illinois as well. So ultimately our goal for Indiana is to have 10,000 uh, new collections of mushrooms by the time I'm done with my PhD and have uh, DNA sequences for the majority of these collections. So technically I finished up my coursework at Purdue. I'm no longer physically at Purdue uh, anymore. Um, I'll, I just need to finish writing uh, my thesis, so I'm a PhD candidate uh, currently. Um, and so I don't know when I'm actually going to be done. Uh, I do have a full-time job now other than uh, PhD work. And so I, I have a little bit of um, extra latitude on when I need to get these 10,000 new collections by, I guess. But the, the, the goal um, ultimately was to get... Uh, <clears throat> To, to have a reasonably comprehensive understanding over the course of about a 10 year time frame from when we started was kind of the initial thought. So here you can see the blue uh, lines are the number of individual collections that we've brought in per year. And you can see in about 2015 is when this thought process really kind of kicked off going. So I've been kind of looking at this project as kind of a 10 year period project from about 2015, probably to about 2025 or so. Uh, 2017, uh, that first online foray is really when we started to get uh, the most collections. Um, and what, one of the things that you in, uh, begin to encounter is even in 2017, we were still kind of in the mindset of we need collections from multiple areas of the state for most species. So I'm not just looking to have a single DNA sequence from a single uh, representative specimen. Uh, for each species. I really want to have some from different areas of the state um, because that's how you can start to identify some of these cryptic species or species groups or species complexes. And so we really started uh, after about 2017, I would say, is when we started to refine more what uh, species were actually interesting to us at that point in time. So as, you, as we started to go through this process, you know, in 2017 with the first online forays, there was still a whole lot that was new and a whole lot interesting. But once we were able to start gathering the data and analyzing the data, 
from some of these early uh, collections, you know, what used to be really, really cool to us in 2017 is really not, is not very cool to us, uh, not nearly as cool to us, I would say, in 2020. Um, because even for undescribed species, you know, I, I, we definitely have hundreds and hundreds of undescribed species um, within our collections and within our state. But even the undescribed stuff, we are starting to get to know uh, relatively well uh, in, in a lot of, uh, for a lot of various groups. Uh, this chart is just an example of the, the impact that citizen science collections can make. So if you, these are collections of macro fungi and herbaria anywhere across the country, I believe, um, over the course of time. And you can see just in recent years how exponentially more collections have been able to be brought in relative to the documented history of our biodiversity throughout time. So let, let me just give a couple more examples of how this has been beneficial um, as I start to wrap up this talk. And so if you think about, uh, so in Indiana, uh, Scott Bates, one of the researchers at Purdue uh, in uh, Purdue Northwest, uh, recently compiled a checklist of all Indiana fungi, macro fungi, that have been placed in herbaria uh, throughout the course of history. And if you look at the current Indiana checklist, it includes about 14 species epithets for agaricus uh, that have been applied to Indiana specimens through, you know, throughout time. And so when you start to look at um, modern collections with uh, the, the added benefit of DNA sequencing, as well as, I have to mention, the book Agaricus of North America. If you're interested in Agaricus at all, it's, it's, it's critical to have this book. Um, I'll explain why in a second. But if you look at our current Indiana checklist relative to what we've been finding um, with uh, our modern collections, only about three of those 14 names are still being utilized. Uh, we, we haven't found any evidence for most of the names, uh, the past names have been utilized uh, within Indiana, only three of the 14. And then we had that, on top of that, we had to add 12 new names to the list. Uh, on top of that, there's about four undescribed species that are believed to occur in our state of Agaricus currently. And keep in mind, this is one of the most well-studied groups of you know, genera of mushrooms uh, that currently exist. Uh, and we're still having a lot of uh, undescribed species even after a North American monograph. So I mentioned uh, Kerrigan's uh, monograph, his book. One of the reasons why it's so good is that all, of, all four of the undescribed species um, that we believe we have are actually mentioned in his book in some context. So to me, that just kind of shows the, the depth of how good his book is, that even the things we're finding that he did not describe, uh, he still uh, has mention of them uh, within the context of that book. And so if you're interested in Agaricus, it's really kind of critical um, to pick up that book and start uh, um, utilizing it for your local species. And so this is some of the same, you know, the, the same process that I was just talking about for Agaricus, uh, and the same process that we're utilizing to be able to come up with our um, ultimate checklists works really well for most other taxonomic groups. So if you look at Amanita as an example, the Indiana checklist has 37 species, epithets that have been used throughout time. About 17 of those names are current, so about 20 uh, we we've, we've found, haven't found evidence for or otherwise misapplied. But we have about 115, I think we're up above 120 now, total species of Amanita within Indiana. And, that, and about two thirds of those are undescribed uh, based on uh, working with uh, Rod Tullis and the Aminataceae website. And so, that just kind of gives, to me, that's, this is one of the best examples of the, the level and the scope of work that actually still needs to be done uh, within the context of uh, discovering our local biodiversity. In terms of chanterelles, I know Patrick has a, a big interest in chanterelles. Uh, I put based on EF1 there, and so there's certain groups of mushrooms that the standard DNA barcode is not very effective. Um, chanterelles would be one. Uh, and, there's several other barcodes we use. We actually use six different genes for chanterelles currently, and we have uh, six genes for probably 120 or so different collections of chanterelles from Indiana at this point. Um, and so there were 11 species in the checklist originally, in the Indiana checklist. Five are now craterellus, and so, you know, that knocks it down uh, right there to actually what's in cantharellus. Uh, four of those names are current. We have about 16 total species um, within our state, uh, we believe, currently. Uh, Anosabe is another example of one where there's a huge amount of work left to do. 17 species in our checklist. 
I would probably put the total number of species in anosobi of Indi in, uh, for Indiana at over 100 species of anosobi. Um, if you look at the species saturation curve for this, most of the 60, I think we might be close to 70 species now of anosobi, most of those are single collections still. So even though we've been collecting, you know, a few hundred uh, and sequencing a few hundred specimens of anosobi, we still have a very, very long way to go uh, in terms of understanding the, the total biodiversity. Um, within anosobi, you do see what you see within fungi broadly in terms of there's a small number of very common species, but then there's just this huge long tail, I have no idea how long it is, uh, of the less common species. Um, and that's also a similar process for Rushula as well. So we have about 88 species of Rushula in our checklist, which in and of itself is quite impressive. Um, and we probably have a, I'd probably put that number now, probably 120 or so total species uh, that we have vouchered specimens for. If you combine the environmental sequencing within uh, that number, I would say we, I would guess at the end of the day, we're probably gonna have about 200 species of, of Rushula within Indiana, um, just based on you know, the amount, the number of DNA sequences that we have from environmental sampling that we have no voucher collections for. And so this just kind of gives the extent of the scope of the work that is left to do to really have a, a firm, or at least a reasonably comprehensive understanding of our local biodiversity, which is, which is my ultimate goal. So one of the things I would like to invite you guys to is the Hoosier Mushroom Society online uh, summer foray for this year. It's gonna be held from August 15th to 22nd. So as I mentioned, it's a week long foray. Um, you can participate if you would like. And we will uh, DNA sequence collections for you just as if they were Indiana collections. Um, so for, for Indiana, um, what we've typically done in the past is I tell people, you can send me whatever you like, and if you don't want to sort through them in, in, in terms of trying to make a determination of what's important or not, um, most people would actually prefer to send me more collections, even if I'm not gonna retain them, just so I have the chance to look at them and make a determination of whether or not they're gonna be valuable. Uh, but I, what I would do for you guys is I, I would leave it that way for you as well, uh, for anyone from Illinois who's interested in participating. Uh, I'm not going to guarantee that um, all of your collections are going to be sequenced. If we have uh, a lot of sequences of the particular species and I'm able to put a name on it, a, re a reasonably good name, um, just based on macro and or micromorphology, um, we probably won't retain the collection. So I just want to be straightforward about that. But if I'm not able to put a name on it um, through those means, uh, it will probably get kicked into the sequencing queue. So if uh, you guys would like to participate, um, a full list of details is at hoosiermushrooms.org and um, it would actually be a great way uh, I believe for you guys to uh, help to jumpstart the, uh, the number of species that uh, are uh, currently being documented from Illinois uh, especially if you live downstate I know a lot a lot of the events from the um, mycological society are held in the Chicagoland region so especially if you're downstate um, if you're kind of midway down Illinois, we're having a foray at Turkey Run and Shade State Park during this week, which is almost to the border of Illinois, about midway down the state. Uh, and so you would be welcome to attend that as well. Uh, but uh, I, I would be happy to answer some questions uh, about this concept. And uh, I would uh, really enjoy it if uh, we could get some Illinois people to start contributing some interesting specimens of mushrooms from Illinois. And so I think, some acknowledgements for you, uh, some various entities and places I've worked with and people who've helped fund uh, some of the work we're doing. Uh, I guess I would mention one other thing just in terms of funding. I would say the bulk of the work that has been done to this point has you know, really been funded through our mycological society, um, which is mo mostly just me, if you wanna be uh, you know, blunt about it. Um, you know, we, we do a number of events every year to help raise money. All, all of that money goes towards this project in particular. Um, but yeah, we, we don't have a large mycological society. I have a few people to help out with various things. Um, but, the, you know, we have roughly 7,200, 7, I believe, in our database currently, specimens that have been DNA sequenced. 
and we've been able to do this uh, just through our, our local my mycological society for the most part. So the AIM Lab has really been uh, very helpful in terms of uh, funding a portion of this. Uh, the hardwood ecosystem experiment uh, that I mentioned, uh, those plots down in southern Indiana, uh, has been helping to fund some of the environmental sequencing. Um, but I would say the, the bulk of the project to this point has really been done as, as a mushrooms, uh, Hoosier Mushroom Society uh, project. And so uh, it's definitely possible for even a small group of people and a, and a small local club to uh, really start generating uh, this level of understanding, you know, to, to actually be able to ask the question and make a reasonable attempt uh, at uh, getting to the goal of knowing all the mushrooms uh, for that epsilon diversity scale, for that statewide scale. Um, I guess one more thing I would mention is that most of what we're doing is directly relative to you guys in Illinois. So if you could still see my screen, all of our data currently, and I said about 7,200, I have probably about two or 300 specimen uh, sequences that I still need to upload. They're sitting on my computer right now. So 72 was a conservative estimate. But all of our data is online. Um, if, uh, you can uh, write me afterwards for the link if you're interested in, in exploring our data. Uh, but all, all of our data is public and uh, we're in the process of getting it into GenBank. Uh, that, that's just, with this many sequences, it's, it's a tall order in and of itself. Um, but uh, if you're, especially if you're working on particular groups of mushrooms, you know, if you're working on uh, Amanitas of Illinois or Inospi of Illinois, I would probably have lots and lots of data that could be very helpful for almost any endeavor within macrofungi that you're working towards. The, this is an example of a project website that we currently have. So when, when I talked about technological developments, this is one of the things I've been working on for probably close to five years now. It, it's just kind of an internal database um, for me to organize this level of data and to make it uh, you know, y utilizable, functional, um, so we have about 7,100 sequences uh, currently within it. Um, so if I know some people on the call are interested in Lacaria. So we have about 52 sequences of Lacarias from Indiana uh, currently. So that, that's kind of how, how it's utilized. And then from there, you can see the different species at the bottom. So I'm not gonna talk too much more about that today. I would also mention our Mushroom Society website. If you're interested in joining one of our events coming up, uh, especially the Shades or Turkey Run, which are closest to Illinois. That's August 22nd, 23rd uh, is when we're going to be going over there. And more information on the summer online foray is available on our website. So with, with that, uh, I, I appreciate you guys uh, inviting me to come talk. And I would be happy to take any questions and, and chat for as long as uh, you're interested and have some questions to pose. Uh, By the way, uh, are you at your home laboratory right now? I am currently, yes. Um, I, I, if you want to see it, I guess. So where, oh, where? Let me take off you. <laughs> uh, we'll take you off the uh, share screen. Okay, let me let me stop the share. Great. So I, I don't know how well this is going to work. That's but, okay. Yeah. So this is. Let me see. There we go. So where I've been talking from is essentially on my DNA extraction bench um, within my lab. So I, how I got started on DNA sequencing, uh, that's another aspect. You know, I wasn't in school. I didn't have any kind of formal instruction um, on how to do it. I just got on the internet one day and decided I wanted to learn about DNA sequencing. So down there, you can see the thermocycler at the far end. Um, that's the, the black table is the elect electrophoresis bench for imaging DNA. Now we got a little fridge for the various reagents. But this is where most of the DNA sequencing work I do is uh, accomplished, you know, just in this small home laboratory. So I don't want to show back here too much, I guess, because it's kind of a mess. But you can just see lots and lots of specimens, uh, the microscope table, the drying area, as well as some fridge, fridges and everything for storing uh, more of the collect. Uh, the extracted DNA. You do the the last step sequencing at the university, then. 
Uh, so I do it through a commercial service called GeneWiz. And so even our, even at the AIM lab at Purdue University, uh, when I was there, we would always use a commercial service for the actual uh, DNA sequencing. So and I would say that's probably true for most of the academic labs uh, that you encounter. Mo I would say most of them send it off to a third party uh, servicer for DNA sequencing. Is your home an herbarium? Uh, you see, you see, you see these uh, cabinets right behind me. That's uh, currently where I store my specimens before they go to the herbarium. Because Michael Crow, a few years ago, indicated he keeps his home at sixty-five degrees all year round mm -hmm. to maintain his personal herbarium. Yeah, um, no, I don't, I don't intend to house all these collections personally for forever. Um, typically, uh, 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 m most of my collections go ultimately end up at Purdue. I probably have a thousand or two thousand here locally, just because as I'm analyzing things, it's very helpful to not have, you know, just to have them at home. Sure. Uh, but yeah, for for the most part, I, I typically do not intend to have my own herbarium uh, at home for any length of time. I have a question on your um, your week four A thing. Yep. The um, Collections that you don't save, do you still save the um, data of what people sent you and locations oh, I, like to get like a list of what was sent, whether it was saved or not? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So as a part of the, so um, the, the observations on iNaturalist uh, have various fields. Um, so if we aren't saving it, we will annotate it essentially that it was received but chosen not to retain. Okay, so putting putting the photos on iNaturalist is a requirement for? Part yeah, of so yeah, if, if there aren't photos to go along with the observation on iNaturalist. So typically, uh, if you read the instructions on our foray thing, what it essentially say is what you need to send is a bag with the dried mushroom with the iNaturalist number on it. Um, so that iNaturalist number is the first thing we'll review for any collection, just to ensure it meets the minimum metadata requirements. Does it have a collection date? Does it have a collection location? Doesn't have to be specific GPS coordinates. Um, but uh, then we're also looking at the pictures. Are the pictures of reasonable quality? Are they going to be helpful? Um, you know, in all honesty, if it's something that's particularly interesting, the picture quality doesn't really matter at all because just having some type of picture quality is far better than nothing. Um, but for things that are marginal, the picture quality can help to influence the decision on whether or not to do it. Um, there's quite often just if they're stunning pictures of something, I'll sequence it just for that purpose. So that way these images are linked to a DNA sequence. Oh, yeah, that's good. Do you have a project on iNaturalist for your studies? I see a lot of Michael Flora groups there. Yeah, so uh, for what we do in Indiana, we start a different iNaturalist project each year. So this one is Indiana Fungi 2020. Um, on top of that, we do a specific project for each of our online forays. So there's a summer online foray and a fall online foray project uh, for iNaturalist for 2020. So ultimately in a given year, there, there would likely be three projects, um, one for each online foray as well as just the main one for that year. We haven't tried to compile an iNaturalist, uh, you know, umbrella project, I think they call it, of all Indiana observations at this point. Um, primarily just because I, I wouldn't have the time to be able to go through it uh, right now and really try to filter it down to uh, reasonable observations. Thank you. Stephen, this is great. This is Greg. It's a, a great, great talk. Um, I would assume that Hoosier um, fungi is probably a, uh, a unicat for the US. Is there, what, what other states are coming, at least uh, approaching the level of data that you have so we can start looking at epsilon data, you know, beyond Indiana, but across, you know, some larger region? Uh, in all honesty, I don't know of any. I couldn't tell you a single other state that would you know, have this level of data. So I, I think I, I was asking. Yeah. <laughs> so, so if you actually look at the amount of data that we've retained for macro fungi, we're approaching, <laughs> uh, we, we have something on the order of 10% the amount of DNA sequences ever, that have ever been generated worldwide for macro fungi. Uh, you know, if we were to upload them all today to GenBank, we're, some, we're maybe like at seven or eight um, percent, maybe more than that now. Uh, so, no, no I, I wouldn't know of another state or a project that's done this much. 
And I mean, keep in mind, it's only been three, four years that we've been doing this. How do bio blitz uh, tests work in with this? Uh, we've had one or two here. Patrick knows more about them, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, yeah, the bio blitzes that are done in different places around the country, the focus is on observing and getting lists and stuff of what is identified. There's not really a focus on saving specimens. So when Greg or I or somebody participates in one to identify mushrooms, um, we usually try and save specimens of the most interesting things and take some photos. Part of the challenge with bio blitz is they pick a date that's going to be uh, appropriate for the largest number of organisms. Yeah, you know, usually in the spring. That prime fungal season because they picked it for bird migration or something like that. So we've been doing them, but they're not necessarily the date I would have chosen if I was going to pick one weekend to, to choose fungi. It may not be the date that the bio blitz that we've been on. Yeah, I would echo that for Indiana. So our Indiana Academy of Science does an annual bio blitz every year and it's always towards like the late spring, early summer. And it's always a place, you know, at the time of the year when there's a, a giant lull in mushrooms. And I've been telling the organizers, you know, at least one year, pick a new date. One of the key reasons that they maintain the dates is that's when the scientists are available. So most of them have academic perches somewhere. Um, and so uh, they're often uh, available during that time and not- uh, We usually do get new stuff at those because it's, it forces us to go to a location we haven't been to before. Yeah, say, same in Indiana. They're always very good at picking locations. I would say most of the years that we have them, uh, I think I've been the fungi team leader for the Indiana Academy of Science one for about five years now. And every year it's always, at a, I've been a lot of places in Indiana and it's usually at a place I haven't been to yet. And so, yeah, that's definitely beneficial. But yeah, we, we also always save uh, all of the fungal specimens that come into that and we make sure, um, you know, I probably, you know, honestly, I probably wouldn't even attend uh, if the permit didn't allow us to, if a permit's required, I guess, but if, right. if, we weren't, yeah. if, we, if we weren't able to save the collections. Yeah. And you can think of like the NAMA for is a mycoblith, right? I mean, it's a oh, absolutely. intensive sampling of, it just happens to be just focused on fungi, but it's a, it's a mycoblith. Mm -hmm. which is great. So Stephen, what's next? I mean, after you've, you know, feel that you have uh, pla you've plateaued your number of new species you're collecting and whatever else, I just wonder, you know, how do you use these data now to answer other questions or, you know, what, what, what do you have in mind? Yeah, so, so for me, I guess, personally, so, so I guess there's a number of different levels I could talk about. So one, one of the first things from a scientific perspective is I'm going to need to get these, all of these DNA sequences into GenBank, uh, just so other, other researchers can utilize it for all of the various things that they're interested in. Um, what, one of the big, um, so I, I would probably say we're going to be continuing on this path until about 2025, I would say, give it another, you know, four or five more years of, you know, continually collecting uh, specimens, doing lots of DNA sequencing for them. Um, some, some, I, I would definitely like to get more environmental data from Indiana. So the um, Hardwood Ecosystem Experiment Project uh, that I talked about, um, we were able to get, uh, we have about three completed Illumina runs from that. So you're, you're talking millions of sequences, but, uh, and from a large, a reasonably large geographic area, but being able to do that in more portions of the state, um, I think would be very valuable in, in terms of getting more of that tail of that species accumulation curve um, for, for a lot of the more rare things, because it actually does a pretty good job in picking that up. Um, but in terms of, you know, what I'm planning to do with this data, I mean, probably what I'll be doing the rest of my life is writing books on Indiana mushrooms, um, you know, just kind of starting with Amanita or you know, Lepiota or, you know, just some group and kind of working on a Fungi of Indiana series, um, kind of culminating all of the data that I've collected into, into uh, some type of um, systemic documentation um, that's, so that's publicly accessible. So for me, that's one of the biggest things is, um, I, I, I hate to say it, I care less about what the academics utilize it for, and I care more about how uh, the public can utilize it uh, because 
that's just kind of where my where my thoughts always go. You know, I started all of this as an amateur, and that's what I still consider myself as. Um, but m making it so people have a, a much easier access to knowledge about fungi has been one of my overall driving uh, desires. And so publishing all of this information, not in a scientific context, but more of a publicly accessible context um, is probably going to be the end result for most of this data. Well, I think that's terrific. I will also say, uh, Stephen kind of played it down, but one of the great things about this work is matching up the environmental samples, actually having specimens associated with it, because when one does environmental sequencing, usually what you do is you get a bunch of reads that there's no name associated with it because it's not in GenBank. And mm -hmm. so by having this match of specimens with that is going to allow us to identify a lot more of these environmental se sequences, which is going to open up all kind of wonderful avenues for uh, understanding the biodiversity and distribution of fungi. So it's, um, it's a terrific uh, contribution to the, to the subject. Oh, yeah. So like uh, uh, for Russia as an example, um, you know, my, my environmental surveys have probably brought in over 200 OTUs and I would say at least a third of them, especially the most prevalent. So I'm still trying to make a determination and this, uh, not everyone might know what I'm talking about, but I'm still trying to make a determination of how well the OTUs are, uh, represent a species level complex, you know, a species level um, concept. And probably at least a third of my top OTUs for something like Rushla from my environmental data set match up almost perfectly, almost to the nucleotide. You know, when, you, when you're looking nucleotide by nucleotide at the alignment, uh, they match up very, very good um, for roughly a third. And then there's kind of a third in the middle to where it's, you know, kind of iffy. And then the bottom third generally get very few matches. And so uh, I, I'm thinking at this point that the, um, the frequency of, you know, recovery for, uh, for sequences from these environmental data sets, my initial thought is roughly, you know, a, a two thirds maybe might be good and the bottom third might just be trash, but I definitely don't have any type of um, full analysis of that to this point. That's great. So people may, so if you think of it, when you do environmental you're just getting the DNA. So it's kind of like the, the book without a, without a, a title. And so you get all these, all these chapters out there, but uh, unless you match it with the fungi above, you don't necessarily have a name on it. And so that's what's um, been great about this work. Uh, well, one other thing I guess I would mention for you guys is um, some of you guys may know, and I never asked Rob for permission to mention it, but uh, for, for our online foray week, uh, Rob Halleck, who does the Mushroom Word of the Day on Facebook, he, he's from uh, Northwest Indiana, and I, I believe he's going to be doing a walk um, at the Dunes area during our online foray week. So that might be a good opportunity for some of you guys to get down into Indiana and, and help uh, a bit if you'd be interested. Well, this, um, this is a is, side ahead. topic, but do you have any recommendations on dryers for mushroom collections? Yeah, so the, the ones I've actually stuck with to this point have been the Excalibur food dehydrators. And so a lot of people don't like them because they tend to blow the mushrooms across the tray. Let me, uh, let me just see if I can't pull you guys over. I have to unplug. Can you still see? Yes. Okay. So these are Excalibur food dehydrators. And give me one second. You can kind of see in there how they are. And the, the, these are trays and the fan is located in the back. And so sometimes the mushrooms tend to get blown down the, uh, down the tray and off the tray are somewhat misorganized. And so I think that's the main gripe that people have against them. But I've just gotten used to, enough, to it enough now that it doesn't cause me any problems. And they're readily accessible. You know, I, can, I, I can always pick up another one if ever I need it. And in, in terms of I, if I'm traveling, I'll often bring a dehydrator with me and I just use one of the cheap, you know, uh, stack ones that you might get at Walmart or something like that. Those work fine. 
Um, so really any type of dehydrator works, uh, but yeah, what I use is the Excalibur. So the reason why it's worked for me, uh, I would say, is just because I've learned how to properly set the trays so things don't get blown everywhere. I put all the largest mushrooms in the back towards the fan, all the smallest mushrooms uh, towards the front. If they're really small mushrooms, I put them in something. So, um, you know, like a, just some type of small little cup or something within the dehydrator. Uh, so that way they don't get lost. You always, I noticed in your photo, you had the, um, your um, DNA tubes on the shelf, you put those in the dryer too? Uh, no. Oh, okay. I, yeah, so that was just for the image. Oh, okay. That was essentially in the box. Yeah, that was done to show how the numbers are utilized uh, on the DNA, okay. on, on the tubes, as well as with the specimens on the drying. Well, um, do you want this? to mention how you're using, um, you've been using the Field Museum collections, especially the NAMA collections? Yeah, so I, I actually can't believe I didn't even mention that. So I intended to. Um, the, uh, so there's several different things within the Field, Muse Field Museum. One, we've been working to sequence um, most of the past collections from NAMA. Uh, so I think we've done over a thousand collections uh, from NAMA events uh, to this point in time. Uh, we've done hundreds of Amanitas, uh, Amanitas and um, for about three years or so, um, we've sequenced hundreds of collections that come in from the NAMA forays that are now uh, at the Field Museum. Um, so, you know, there's a huge chunk of uh, data coming in from really all over the country as a part of that, and as a part of uh, the Microflora project as well. Um, the, uh, something we've been working on, and I, I saw Wyatt was on here, and I'm especially grateful to Wyatt because he's been helping me take tissue samples of uh, uh, Field Museum collections from Indiana that are, are currently there. So I, our, our goal is to DNA sequence every, or at least attempt a DNA sequence on every post-1980 Indiana collection that currently exists at the Field Museum. So, we're, I mean, we've probably done, we've done all the Rushlas, um, all the Amanitas. So I think we're probably about, I want to say 800 to 1,000 collections, something in, on, on, on that order uh, to this point. Um, and, and why did I have, uh, I just got, Sent, sent off a few hundred more um, from this last set. So everything I have has now been uh, sent off to the sequencing facility. Um, but yeah, so our, our goal is to really sequence every Indiana collection post 1980 that exists at the Field Museum. So if Wyatt said there, uh, Wyatt, does that include yes. all of my unaccessioned stuff that we got from the nitrogen addition plots that maybe haven't been accessioned yet or haven't been identified? Uh, yeah, the bulk of what we're sending in is non-accessioned. Um, I, yeah, yeah, we were definitely working through that material. But we should coordinate to make sure that uh, you don't have any stuff that's that I don't know about that should be included in this. But but the answer is yes. Terrific, terrific. So yeah, and the, the plan is just to continue on with that at a reasonable pace until it's done. So, uh, you know, it doesn't matter how long it takes. Uh, that's just an ongoing project that we'll uh, continue working on. Um, somebody is asking if the Turkey Run Shades forays are in person. So they, they are actually distance. Yeah, they, they are actually in person. Um, so we, we do social distance on our, on our forays. You know, we generally try not to get, you know, we don't have a, a meeting at the end where we, you know, sit there and examine all of them individually um, right in each other's faces. So we, we'll, we will call it as a group. Um, but also if you're interested in attending one of those, you don't have to go with the group if that makes you uncomfortable. Um, but yeah, we, we, um, we, we will be going out as a group uh, and, and distancing. When we, when we talked yesterday, I think you indicated sometimes your groups are like, like 10 people. Yeah, so, so often. So it's, that's easy to, to manage. Yeah, so we're not talking 100 people are going to be at this thing by any means. So no. yeah, the tur tur turkey run and shades are usually some of our better attended forays. And we're, you know, I would say max 20. Um, but with this whole pandemic, I would say it's probably going to be 10 or so people. So it's not, it's, not, it's not a large number of people to try to be able to keep distant from. It's exciting you're even doing anything because we're just like, not. <laughs> and it's because it's, it's, it just doesn't, we, we just, well, we have a very different situation. 
Oh, yeah. Not as much freedom as you have. Yeah. And I mean that relative to just the whole license process, not the, right, get, you know, it's it. not political. It's just, well, it is in a sense, but. Yeah, you know. in a sense. <laughs> well, yeah, one of the Chicago problems is that we don't have the state parks and state forests right here. Mm -hmm. Maybe if we try and, if we get people in the habit of driving farther, we can try that next year. Excuse me, you said you were going to have a foray at the dunes, Indiana State Dunes? Yes, that would be at the Dune State Park most likely. Uh, I, d I don't have the details on it yet. It'll be posted to our website uh, once it's available. Sweet. I think we're finished maybe, but if not, I mean, if somebody else has another question, but it's every time I try to wrap it up, it's like somebody jumps in and I don't want to step on anybody's toes. Could you tell us Stephen's website? Uh, URL again? Maybe yes. Yeah. Ho HoosierMushrooms.org. Oh, HoosierMushrooms.org. Thank you. Yeah, H-O-O-S-I-E-R. Well, thank you very much. So glad you don't have to now jump in the car and drive 138 miles home. Yeah, that does make it a little bit better, but yeah, it is a little bit awkward just kind of talking to a blank screen, uh, talking to a webcam, essentially. Uh, it's not something I have too much experience in, but uh, it worked out okay. I think. We've all learned new skills in the last few months, yep. whether we liked it or not. Yeah. Well, we hope to meet you in the flesh one of these days. Um, it's not going to be this year, obviously, no. but it was very impressive, your talk. Thank you so much for spending your time with us today. Okay, thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you.